So, hello everyone, and first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to speak, and second of all, given that it's seventh week, I'm amazed any of you are still standing and are here. I thought I'd start by briefly explaining roughly lots of the different things my group does before I went on to talk about a few things in more detail. So this is the group, that's all of us, I'm sort of casually standing in the middle of all of them, and if I go around this slide, it gives an idea of the four main areas we work on. So I'll start here on the bottom left, I'm good at this. One of the things we think about is small molecules. And the reason I think about them is not the normal reason. Normally when people talk about that, they start by saying that they're a chemist and they're interested in small molecules. I start by saying I'm interested in proteins, and I'll talk about them lots more, the active molecules in your body. So I'd like to know how we can, in some senses, how we can interfere with them, which is basically what a drug does. It blocks a protein from working or makes a protein work more. So how you can do that and how this happens. Then if I go up, it's about networks. So how do the proteins interact with one another? How do they engage with one another in order to make things happen? Why does your system work at all? And then something which a lot of my group work on, which kind of relates to everything else, is in the area of immunoinformatics. And the question really here is, I, I've seen a talk that's actually titled this, which is, why aren't you dead? And it's a very basic question because actually there are millions of things quite literally that are trying to kill you all the time and that's from when you are born in fact from before you were born and all through your life all sorts of diseases and infections or even just things you eat and how does your body stop that from happening and that's a really important question fairly obviously and what makes it in some senses more important or also more useful is that it turns out that we can use those natural molecules in the body that do those kinds of things to help us cure diseases or at least help raise different um, attributes against diseases to make ourselves better. And then finally, the thing I'm actually gonna start talking about today is the protein structures themselves. Proteins are the functional molecules in your body. They're the functional molecules in every biological system. So. What do they look like? Why do they look like that? How come they're that shape? And can I understand how to predict that shape or use that shape or understand what they do from all of that? So the title, The Protein Structure Universe from Creation to Medicine, because I was trying to make it sound exciting for everybody without writing the word AI. <laughs> so no AI, but still exciting, promise. And I always feel like I have to start the talk here. And this is really because I had a graduate student once um, a guy called Rodri was a very, very good football player. And he was at a dinner at Oxford. And somebody sitting next to him asked him what he did. And he said, I fold proteins. Yeah. And the chap sitting next to him, who actually it turns out I know as well, said, what? You mean like steak? <laughs> no, I don't mean like steak. I, I, I don't at all. What I mean are these things. OK, they are molecules in your body. So 30 angstroms, that's times 10 to the tiny, minus 10 of a meter. So that's the kind of scale we're talking about. And there are literally billions and billions of these in your system. So what is a protein? Well, they make up your muscles. So that's actually myosin. You need about a couple of trillion of those which is what powers your ability. And the example that's actually on the websites that you read is to pick up and throw a baseball. Obviously, I'm going to say to pick up and throw a cricket ball. But that is what contains that elastic energy. Now, it's not a single one of those, because you need lots of them together. But it's a functional molecule in that way. Or if you want to think about it in a different way, if you've ever watched uh, an advert for shampoo, that's the keratin they're always talking about. So you need this, makes your hair shiny and nice. Yep. That's what it actually looks like. That's what making up your hair. But you can go to other things. So you have things like enzymes. So that's actually the enzyme trypsin. So there we're thinking more like a chemist might think about this. These are molecules in your body that make a chemical reaction happen faster or more precisely or lower the energy barrier to do it so that your body can carry out its functions. Or the ability to send signals. So that's an ion channel that allows molecules to go from inside your cell to outside or vice versa. And finally, back again, defending against disease. So this is an antibody molecule. So why do I care so much about what they look like? And I mean, I really do like what they look like. And it's because shape dictates function. I always try and think of different ways of explaining this. So I'm going to go with the screwdriver way today. How many of you have ever come up to go and unscrew something and it turns out, and it can be either way around, but the really frustrating one is usually that it's a flathead screw, so it's got a straight line like that. The only screwdriver you've got is a crosshead. 
Now, when you try and do that, it's really hard to get that screw out. And the reason for that is very simple. It's because the shape is wrong. And shape actually dictates your function. So if you think in terms of an iron channel, if that channel is just slightly too wide or slightly too narrow, all of a sudden, the thing that goes through it won't go through it. Or more things will go through it that you didn't want to go through. And it gets even worse than that, because when I talk about shape here, don't stop at static shape. I need that to be able to open and close, because sometimes I want it shut. So if you think about shape and all of its forms, so it's the shape of these things that dictates what they do. And that comes down to be true even if I think about the antibody for defending your system. It's the shape of that interface that allows it to bind to things. So if I don't know what that shape is, I don't know what it does. So I'm hoping I'm sort of convincing you that proteins are kind of important and a little bit exciting. But obviously the way to do this is to show you news stories from the Daily Mail because that's how everyone does importance. So this is a story. It's actually from some time ago now. It's from 2015. But the Daily Mail likes to do stories on mad cow disease. How many of you know what have heard of mad cow disease? Yeah, OK. So mad cow disease is actually quite a simple disease in some sense. It's a misfolded protein. That's all it is. Turns out, though, that's very dangerous in your body, proteins misfolding. And by that, I mean that is the cause of Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, Huntington's. A lot of brain diseases are related to this. So understanding how proteins fold so you can avoid misfolding is actually an incredibly important thing. You can also think about a very obvious thing. If I know the shapes of, say, those ion channels, I can design, I would hope, small molecules that can bind to them so I can target proteins because they're the active molecules, so I want to be able to do something for them. And then finally, which is something I will talk about at the end, is I can design proteins themselves as drugs. So this is a story that was came out today. I don't know if any of you saw it on the BBC website. It was all over, um, certainly the radio news today. This is a particular antibody, which I'm very bad at saying antibody drug names. So read Pembromizilab. It's like, sort of like that. It begins with a P and ends ab will do. And this was actually designed as a drug to be against head and neck cancer. So it's a drug. It's an, it is a, an antibody. It is a protein that has been designed. And what it does is is actually a preventative... Well, preventative is a bit strong. It helps to relieve the symptoms of head and neck cancer. And they have just shown that in people who have prostate cancer, that they've done a, a medical trial on this, that you can get to the stage, these are people who had no other treatment and is now working, this will actually help, so it can prolong life. Unfortunately, I can't tell you that it will cure it because it doesn't work quite that well. But you can see now, if I can design <coughs> proteins as drugs, they can be incredibly effective. And I'll talk a lot more about that at the end of the talk. So given I like proteins so much, why don't I do the obvious thing, which there are lots of people who work on, which is determine protein structures experimentally? And, well, I could. In fact, I have some very good friends who do this. And the reason I don't do this is, one, because, well, when my friends were writing a joke biography for it, the first line of it was, Charlotte, too clumsy to be a wet lab chemist, which is very accurate, unfortunately. But the reality is it's not really going to solve the problem. And the reason it's not going to solve the problem is solving structures experimentally is incredibly expensive, difficult and time consuming. So one way to describe this is I was recently talking to some people in a pharmaceutical company who had um, paid to get a structure solved, actually by an academic group. And they'd said to them, we want you to solve this structure. Now, it was quite a complicated structure, but they wanted it solved. It cost them two and a half million pounds. There you go. One structure. And they didn't even get the whole structure. There were bits missing because they couldn't solve the whole thing. And it took three and a half years. Now, that's not worst case scenario. Worst case scenario is total fail, which does actually happen quite commonly. Best case scenario, you're probably talking in the region of £100,000 to solve a protein structure. That doesn't sound too bad, except you're talking about that once you have a one of those. So that's a synchrotron, like diamond, which, which costs quite a lot of money, or a cryo-EM machine, which still won't solve it to the resolution you want. So experimentally solving protein structures is incredibly important, and I want people to do lots of this, but it's never in the near future going to actually be able to give us all the protein structures of things we have. It's not going to happen. So we're going to need to be able to do these things on a computer. <coughs> 
So how do we think about doing it, given it's so expensive? Now, you are also very young, that probably back in 2000, you weren't reading Nature and Science. But back in 2000, they actually wrote the article saying, we have sequenced the human genome. And this, in some sense, was meant to be, we have solved medicine. It turned out, not solved medicine. But it was the beginning of quite a big story. So your genome, it's about 3.2 billion DNA bases, in case you're interested. I don't know. Um, and it sort of looks like this. <laughs> yep. Now, this is not terribly useful information as it stands. Each one of those is a DNA base, which does have a three-dimensional structure, but doesn't help you very much because it doesn't tell me what the protein looks like. What's exciting about this and useful to me is this part of the story. Back then, when they solved the human genome, it was incredibly expensive to do so. So we're back in the early 2000s. To solve a genome, now they kind of, this is basically cost per human genome. So if plant genomes are a lot bigger, in case you're wondering, they're more complicated than we are. Mouse genomes about the same as us, chimps about the same as us. You can have some simpler things, yeast, that's a lot simpler than us. So it costs about 100 million then. So there's no way you could solve all the genomes. Now, the cost of sequencing a human is probably about $1,000. That means I can sequence. <coughs> and actually, to be honest, even I can sequence in the sense that you can get money and just pay someone to sequence stuff. And you can sequence lots and lots of things. So we now have huge amounts of the sequence information. <coughs> So what I want to be able to do is take this sequence information and turn it into those three-dimensional structures I was talking about. That is the gap that I want to be able to close. And just to make sure everyone's on the same page, I'm fairly certain most of you will have seen this before, but the central dogma. So I've got tons of this DNA. In a standard system, DNA is transcribed into RNA, which is translated into protein. So I can very easily, no brain thought required at all, write out the sequence of amino acids that make up my protein. But that doesn't answer the question I asked because what I want is this three-dimensional structure. So what I want to be able to go from is this sequence of letters, which is a sequence of amino acids or residues, into a three-dimensional structure. That's the key step because this is easy and cheap. This is incredibly expensive. So if I could just do that to that, I would be very happy. And this is called the protein folding question. And one of the things I always say about this is, if someone actually managed to solve this, it's not solved yet, in case you're interested, I haven't done it, um, they would definitely win a Nobel Prize. Okay? They, it would be because it's such a lovely, simple way of phrasing something and such an important thing to be able to understand. So when you think about protein folding, it is really simple. What I'm saying is, I have a string of letters, and they must, in some sense, contain all the information that gives me this three-dimensional shape. <coughs> they are residues. They contain all that information. So it's a bit like this. Now, this is not an origami puzzle I can solve, but basically, you can draw out the instructions on a sheet of paper. I don't know if you can see all the lines on that, that would allow you to make a beetle out of it. And it's quite incredible to watch someone folding that, but it's perfectly doable. So in the same way, that's my question here. So why can't I do it? Because the information's there, I kind of understand the problem I'm posing. And this is really kind of starting to explain why I can't. So that's my three-dimensional structure. And instead of saying that what I have is a nice piece of paper with lines on, what I really have is a physics problem here. It's an energetics <coughs> problem, OK? Because there's the energy. And clearly, this should probably be the lowest energy state. So this is my folded shape. And all other states should have higher energy. So if I actually knew what that energy landscape looked like, I could take that kind of string and I could go, it will look like this. But I can't. And I can't for two reasons. One is the size of the conformational space. Now, this is a very well-known and established thing, and I'll talk a bit about it more. But the reason this picture is on here, I don't know if any of you have ever um, seen this example, but if you put one bead on the first square of a chessboard, how many beads do you have if you put two on the second and four on and, and so on? How many would I have by the time I got to the last square? Yeah, conformational space actually starts to get very big very, very quickly. And the other issue I have, unfortunately, is despite the fact that I think I understand physics, and there are lots of physicists who really think they understand physics, turns out this is a really difficult energy surface and 
the energy functions are all very inaccurate. So working out exactly how this will fold is incredibly difficult because if this energy is out even just a little bit, your native state, so your lowest energy that you're looking for, which you think is here, the energy function is wrong, so it actually drops this one down lower and that's now it thinks is the right answer. And it turns out that that's actually what happens most of the time if we look at physics functions to do this. So to give you an idea of the conformational space, there was a guy back in 1969, Leventhal, who put it very, very nicely. And this is called Leventhal's Paradox. He wrote a paper about it. So most proteins fold in seconds or less. OK, so they're folding all the time in you right now, accurately and correctly. So this is fine. Imagine it's 100 residue proteins. Imagine what we've got. And then let's make it really easy, because I like easy maths. Imagine there are only three possible conformations per residue. That's all we've got. So then the number of possible folds, it's easy maths, is 3 to 100. Now, that is clearly a massive underestimate. OK, there'll be way more than three conformations for each one. But even if I just say there's three, <laughs> that gives me this number. Um, yep, I, that will do it. It's big. To give you an idea, let's think about this. Let's assume a protein can explore a new conformation at the same rate that bonds can reorientate. OK, so that's bonds being able to just flick like this. But there's no way, actually, they could explore a new conformation at that rate. But that's at least that's probably as fast as it's possible to imagine they could do this. That actually means I could do 10 to the 13 structures a second. Ah, that's a lot. It's not enough, though, because the time it would take me to explore all those conformations is 5 times 10 to the 34 seconds or 1.6 times 10 to the 27 years, which is longer than the age of the universe. So the paradox is very simple. Given the conformational space, there is no way I search it. However good my computer program is, I have lost, because I'm definitely not going to go at that rate in a computer. Yep, and you're not going at that rate in your body. Now, there are fairly obvious counter-arguments to this, like obviously you're not searching all those conformations. But in order to not search all those conformations, you have to understand that energy landscape, which we don't understand. So how do we get round this? Well, we get round it, and this is why I have to get my literary references right. So this is not Frankenstein. This is Frankenstein's monster because somebody always corrects me when I do this. So Frankenstein's monster. I am hope you are all aware of how Frankenstein's monster was generated. So what he did, let's go and steal lots of body parts, and then we sew them together. Yep. And then we stick electricity through it, and here comes a monster. Now, imagine you made proteins in the same way. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take little chunks of other proteins, so fragments, and then I'm going to stitch them together so I can make a Frankenstein protein. All right. Now, what's good about that? Well, what's really good about that is I know that each one of those individual little fragments, its energetics is fine. So now I'm only concerned about the energetics between the fragments. I've also massively reduced my conformational space. What's sensible about it? Well, I hope you've kind of noticed, because I've shown you lots of pictures of protein structures on the way through, there are lots of kind of repeating motifs within protein structures. So it's not utterly stupid to think that I could stitch together lots of fragments of different proteins to build another one which is also sensible. OK? But what's the problem with it? Well, this was actually put together for me by a student, which I thought was a really good way of describing this, so I've totally stolen their slide, which is, imagine you're solving a jigsaw puzzle. OK? But I'm not going to give you the picture, because I don't like you. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you the pieces, they're in a box, but in that box, instead of just being the pieces of your jigsaw puzzle, I'm just going to tip in the pieces of about 18 different jigsaw puzzles. OK, and I want you to make a picture for me now, please. Uh, oh, yeah, then I thought, oh, that's too easy. So I'm going to stick my hand in and I'm going to take a few handfuls out so some of the pieces of the puzzle are now missing. OK. So you don't know what it's looked like, what it looks like. You haven't got all the pieces, and you've got lots and lots of pieces from all the wrong puzzles. And all you, so now build me the right jigsaw. Now you kind of get why this is a little bit challenging. So what we're trying to do here, and it's this bit that we now need to focus on, is I don't know the answer, but I need to give you guidance as to how to select pieces. And that's where you need an energy function. So effectively now, I can't tell you what it looks like, but I can tell you things that are bad things to do. So I can stay with the jigsaw analogy for a bit. One of the things you'll be trying to do is not have things overlap other things, for example. So when you're making a jigsaw, you know, you want the, I think they are actually called knobs and holes. You want them to fit into one another. 
Yep. And you don't put two knobs on top of one another, <laughs> preferably. And so that's, I don't want any physical clashes in the protein structure. And then you have other things you would say, well, obviously, if you're doing a jigsaw puzzle, you'd say, I want colours that are similar to be next to one another because that makes sense. So in the same way, you might think that I want to get the energetics right here, so I actually want to be able to form certain types of bonds and those kinds of things. So how does this actually work? Well, oh dear, sorry. I will explain what it says under there. Um, you derive an energy function, and I've deliberately put no maths in the entire presentation, mostly because it takes a really long time to explain a maths equation, and I don't think it necessarily helps people to understand what I'm trying to say. So you use a Bayesian treatment of the residue distribution of known protein structures. What does that mean? That means I can take all the protein structures we currently have. So to give you an idea, there's about 140,000 solved protein structures now. And I can ask, let's, let's ask some easy questions to start with. I can say, how often is an alanine near another alanine? So that's two residues. How often are they close together, within a certain distance or a certain distance apart? Now, that gives me a probability when I'm building my <coughs> new protein. Well, alanines much more commonly close together than they are far apart, for example. And you can get more complicated. Obviously, I've got 20 different types of amino acids. I could do it at an atomic level. I could say, how often do I see a carbonyl oxygen near a nitrogen? Yep. And I can build up this statistical picture of what should happen. And that's this idea of these pair potential terms. You then have an idea of solvation potential terms. That's a really nice thing, which is, what do I see on the outside of a protein versus what do I see in the middle? Fairly obvious answers to this. On the outside of the protein, I'm going to tend to see things which are hydrophilic, that like being in water. Inside of the protein, I'll see things that are hydrophobic. But you can statistically calculate how common these things are, so you have another statistical pencil you can put in. Sterics, that's kind of what I've already said, which is don't let things bang into one another. It should be physically possible for these atoms to sit in the positions they do. And then one of the things you actually have to put in is this compactness term, which is you have to sort of force it to fold into a shape, because it turns out that proteins are quite compact objects. And actually, if you don't make it do that in a lot of these functions, what happens is it likes just being a nice string, because then it doesn't violate anything else, so it's, it's very happy. Another thing which I'll talk about a little bit more is one of the things we're quite good at doing is predicting some of the distances in a protein. So for particular positions in the protein, I can predict a distance, it won't be completely accurate, to another point in the protein in the folded shape. And I'll explain how we do that. So that's another constraint you can put in. And then I do a Monte Carlo search. And this is always my favorite bit of this because basically I build lots of Frankensteins. So I take pieces, I put them together, and I go, based on what I know, is this a good thing to have built? Yeah. OK, one done. Repeat, 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 until I've made lots of these. And different programs decide on different numbers they might make here. And then I select my final answer. And you can select it in different ways. Here I've said I select it using the energy function. You can actually select it by the most common shape I have made. I have made this shape 100 times. I've made no other shape more than once. Maybe this is the right shape, because I just keep making it. OK? And these are ways of doing this. Now, I'm now going to say, this is what we used to do. And things changed quite dramatically at the end of last year. Did any of you notice the, I think I have to use the word hype, around AlphaFold? A little bit. Did you hear about AlphaGo? Yeah, a little bit. OK, so there is a company called DeepMind, which is part of Google, which um, has spent a lot of time thinking about, see, now I have to say it, machine learning. And <coughs> the original kind of thing that caught the headlines was they wrote a machine learning program, so they wrote a computational program that was able to beat the world's best Go player. And this was considered to be an incredibly difficult task. Go is a, in terms of potential number of moves, a much more difficult problem than playing chess. Okay, so people were very impressed by this. And I should say the Go player has now announced his retirement and doesn't want to play Go anymore because he thinks no one can beat a computer. I think that bit's a bit sad. So another one of the problems they turned their attention to was this problem of predicting the three-dimensional shape of proteins. Because, as I said, if you could actually do it, you'd win a Nobel Prize. So it's clearly one that people will care about a lot if they could do it very well. And they actually did do it very well. And the way they did that was thinking about that question I talked about, about predicting distances within the protein structure. So 
<coughs> the way you can think about predicting distances, if you imagine each one of these colored lines in here, so these ones here, okay, these are all proteins that fold to the same shape. Now, the reason that I can find lots of proteins that fold, I don't know what the shape is at the moment, I just know they all go to the same shape. Now, the reason I know they all go to the same shape is they're all evolutionary related. And one way to give an easy description of that is, for example, if you think about, I don't know, we can go back to the keratin molecule, which is hair. There are versions of the keratin molecule in lots and lots of species. You may have noticed we're not the only species with hair. Or you can think about something like haemoglobin, which is um, helping to carry the oxygen around in your blood. Pretty much every mammal has got a version of haemoglobin. But their sequences are not identical but they carry out the same function, they're evolutionary related, and so they will have the same shape, roughly. Not exactly the same shape, but a very similar shape. So I can line up all their sequences, and then I've got these symbols on here, which are the different amino acids. And the idea was this concept of correlated mutations, and this is a very simplistic picture of it, but imagine that you find two positions in that sequence alignment where whenever it's a red, I don't know, scoopy thing in one, it's a green round thing in the other, yeah, and vice versa. So it's correlated. So when I change one column in this alignment, it changes the behavior of another column. Now, what that indicates potentially is that those two columns are in contact because what's going on is because this amino acid changes, I must also change this one. It says, well, the reason I'm doing that is because when this one gets bigger, this one has to get smaller. If this one suddenly becomes positive, this one must be negative. So it's about a way of saying that these two things are near one another. And I guess about six or seven years ago now, we started to be able to write very successful software for predicting contacts using this type of information. It started to become quite good. It's not great, but it really is quite good. And that's the predicted contacts I was talking about in the program, so you can do this. So what did AlphaFold do that was different? Because we already had all of this. Well, they did this. Now, this isn't actually the image of how AlphaFold works, but it's a similar kind of idea because they actually haven't published their method or made it available or allowed anyone to test it. So it's a little bit difficult. But the basic idea is instead of using a statistical estimation of whether those correlations are happening or not, which was what was happening before, I'm now going to al allow a machine learning method to decide whether there is a close distance between these by telling it that I want it to understand correlations. <coughs> so it's now learning those correlation patterns for me. And actually they did more than that. They also tried to get it to learn other features of the protein, so like the secondary structure of the protein, which we're very good at predicting. So they used a lot of features and fed them into the machine learning algorithm. Turned out this worked very well. And there are now many other people who have written software that does similar things. And they did two things with this information. One was, instead of just saying that these two positions are in contact, they tried to predict an actual distance between them. So instead of saying, ah, well, I can see these are correlated, so they must be near one another, which is what the previous predictions did, they went, I have learnt, or this machine has learnt, to be able to say, not only are these two things near one another, I think these are most likely to be at eight angstroms, and then they'll have another example where they'll go, I think these are most likely to be at nine and a half angstroms. And it turned out that that change in information, there's a lot of people who've shown this now, was probably the most important. So they got very excited and put up a lot of GIFs like this. This is AlphaFold doing its folding. We're very excited. Yep, it will keep doing it, jumping over there. But this is about what, it re what really happened and what it really did. So there is this, you're not meant to call it a competition. So the C here stands for comparative. It's comparative assessment of protein structure prediction. That's CASP, but it's a competition. And the idea is that you're trying to predict your protein structures as well as possible. And they actually only give you the sequences. And there is no information about those structures in the public domain. And then the structures are released several months later. So this is true prediction to see how well these methods are working. I'm not going to explain everything on the axes here, but the score on this axis is how good the models are. If you'd actually solved the protein folding problem, we would be here. Just to be clear, we're quite a long way away from there. So when they say AlphaFold has done this, no, I, you need to be here to have solved it. And this is through the years of the competition. It happens every two years. So this is the most recent one. That's two years before, two years before, two years before. And the yellow and blue, this is the who came second in CASP, and that's who came first in CASP in each year. 
So the things that are noticeable on this graph, which is why everyone got excited about alpha fold, and it is exciting, is if we had just kept at kind of the same rate of progress we'd had for the last few years, you would have expected us to end up somewhere about here. Okay, that's where we roughly, that was an estimation of where we would think we would be. We would have improved, but not that much. Actually, what happened is this, okay? So it's better. It also has a much bigger gap over the second place method, so people got very excited about that. But, and this was put very well by the author of this particular blog, if you'll notice, exactly the same amount of improvement, and perhaps more impressively, because it took you from really getting it wrong to almost getting it right, happened over the course of two CASPs here. So basically, you got the improvement of two CASPs in one, in some sense. And there are all sorts of other caveats that people will say, because this is the 95% confidence interval. They still completely overlap. So how much better is it really than all of the others? I would argue, actually, it is quite a lot better than the others. But I'd also argue that pretty much all these methods have incorporated everything that was in that. So they're all sitting there now as well. But it was an interesting step change in the way that we did protein structure prediction. So I'm now going to talk about what we do in this whole problem that's a bit different from all of that kind of general background. So I've been telling you so far about kind of this is how everyone does it. And we do all these things too. But there's something specific that I think is sort of missing from the way that the others are doing it. And it's a very obvious thing, which is proteins don't fold like that picture I just showed you from alpha fold. They don't sit there waiting like this and then fold up into a three-dimensional structure. Proteins are produced, they're translated on a ribosome. And it turns out that the translation rate is much slower than the folding rate. So I told you that most proteins fold in less than a second. That's true. It's a true statement. But they actually translate way slower than that. So many proteins, the rate of translation, it takes several seconds to translate a protein. So... You have to imagine that while a protein is being translated, it is probably folding. Now, why do I care about that? Let's go on, go. There we go. Right. I care about it because of this. So if you imagine the traditional approach, I have all of the residues there already. OK? And so I'm trying to fold this thing, but I have the whole string. And you didn't see the very first set of moves there because it always happens too quickly. If I do the approach where I'm saying it's happening co-translationally, you can see that the residues appear. And you can see that's happening on the left-hand side there. So why would I like the left one over the right one? Well, I like the left one because it's more like biology. But I actually like it because when I'm solving the equations here, all residues are present. So every calculation involves, say this is 300 residues, 300 things. When I'm solving the equations over there, I only have to solve it for one residue to start with, and then for two, and then for three, and then for four. So I have lots of smaller optimization problems. So it's faster. Now, this is real time. Well, not. So the difference here is real. So this would keep going for longer than this, even though they're doing exactly the same process. Now, the problem with that is the potential for this, the co-translation approach, to produce, um, if you like, get trapped on the way. Because what I've just done is I've said, well, if everything's not there, it could fold up the first part and that could be incorrect, and then it wouldn't be able to make the correct structure. But I'm arguing that's OK, because I think that the, if this is how they fold in your system, then it won't do that. It won't get kinetically trapped in the wrong structure along the way. So obviously, <coughs> I've picked something where this is true, because that's the correct answer here. This is how well we did. That's worse. This is good. But it's really this double-edged thing. So. If co-translation works, in fact, I only have to be as good as the traditional approach, but because I will be computationally a lot faster. Turns out, probably, depends how you code it, but two and a half to three times faster. That doesn't sound like much until I remind you that I want to make thousands of decoys, so it takes thousands of hours to do these things. So reducing that by half or a third is you know, a real improvement. So am I telling you the truth? Well, I hope you'll believe me that I am. This graph on the left, it's that same score I was showing you earlier, except now it's between 0 and 1. So perfect predictions will be at 1. Anything that is below, so each one of those round dots is a protein that we did prediction of. And anything that is below that diagonal line was predicted better co-translationally than, if you like, in the standard way of doing it. So I started with a fully extended chain and let it fold. 
So basically, most of the time, I do better predicting in this way, <coughs> doing what biology does. And this is just one example of the kinds of structures you get out. Another way of showing you about this efficiency is here I'm going to take a set of 245 proteins. And what I'm going to do is make <coughs> models of these proteins. And I'm just going to check how long it takes before I get one that's good. So there's a particular marker of good, which is basically 0.5 on that scoring system. And if I do that with my co-translational method, that's the red line. And if I do it the other way, so as if it's non-sequential, so everything's there, it's the blue line. And what you notice is you can see very quickly that the number of cases with a correct model is much higher with the co-translational. So if I do it in that way, I'm much more likely to find that native state when I'm just making these decoys. And it's because actually it's searching less of the space. It can't search lots of the space. I've confined it because I fold up the N-terminal first. So it's not going to search the entire space. So the thing I haven't shown you in all of that is a comparison to AlphaFold. And the reason I'm not showing that is because in some sense it doesn't matter. Because you can do AlphaFold exactly how I've done this. Why don't you just put the co-translational thing into AlphaFold? It would offer you the same improvement there probably, as you have here. It's a comparison of like against like. So I'm not claiming to be able to fold proteins better than the best things that can. Turns out we're about as good, but I don't think that's the issue. The issue is more thinking about how you can do your search strategy and how you should fold proteins if you want to do good structure prediction. And I always think that this is a nice way of thinking about the end part of this. There we go. So you can think about other things that might affect it. So I've just said co-translation by saying the protein's being produced. The protein's produced in a ribosome. It comes out through a ribosome tunnel. So here, I'm, that's like purple, if you like, cylinder. So it's going to start in a particular shape, and then it's going to have to fold whilst some of it is fully extended, because that's the only way it can come out of the ribosome tunnel. So you can think of many ways you can constrain this problem by using how biology folds, because actually, as I said, in your bodies, these proteins are folding accurately, rapidly, continuously, with no problems at all, in less than a second. So if you want to do it well on a computer, you might want to think about how well we can do that. I'm now going to make a tiny step change just to talk about one other thing to make it <laughs> seem like I do practical things as well. So I'm going to talk a little bit about antibodies. So I have, once again, this is the um, news I was talking about earlier, about the development of antibodies, and in this case, helping prostate cancer. I really like this one about shark antibodies that might target breast cancer. It just it seems a good juxtaposition. But it is, uh, it is actually a real thing. So there is development of a particular antibody against breast cancer that is actually taken from a shark. Just you know, helps, obviously. So where does this idea that you can make drugs from antibodies come from? So, it's been estimated that a standard human can make, well, get lots of different numbers here. <laughs> Somewhere probably circulating in your system might be 10 to the 12 different antibodies. And just to make this clear, your 10 to the 12 will be different from my 10 to the 12. Some of them will be the same, but most of them will be different. And the number of potential different ones is absolutely enormous. And what they do is they recognize harmful molecules. So they recognize non-self, they bind to it, and by doing so, they basically make the rest of your system come out and kill that non-self. So if you've got a cold right now, your antibodies are going crazy trying to kill it. And this is amazing, okay? It really is one of the biggest reasons that you're not dead. But what I want to be able to do is not only understand how that system works, I want to be able to do this. So if the antibodies in my body can target a specific foreign invader and they target it with high affinity, that's exactly what you want a drug molecule to do. You want a drug molecule to go and uh, attach to a very specific target. Okay, choose your target, particular protein, particular misfolding, whatever. And you want it to bind to it with high affinity so that you can use it as a way of attacking that particular protein or molecule. And they are completely amazing because that kind of variability in amongst them means that they can be raised against almost any antigen. And there are lots of them that have been designed now, and they prove to be very effective treatments, particular in sort of three cases, but the ones people hear about a lot are in immune disorders and cancers. Because it turns out those are very difficult things to target with small molecule drugs. 
And one of the reasons for that is because this is almost self. So cancer is basically self, as in you are overproducing cells. So how, if I gave you a drug, it will attack you and the cancer because there are only very minor differences between those two things. But it turns out that antibodies are actually pretty good at these kinds of problems. I think that number's somewhat out of date, but there are a very large number of approved antibody drugs, and there are hundreds in late stage development. And this is the quote I have to say when I want to get money out of pharmaceutical companies, which is three of the top 10 biggest selling drugs currently are antibodies. So they are an incredibly important form of medication right now, and they are growing in importance all the time because they are able to target diseases which other types of drugs cannot. And that's quite an important part of this. So once again, why do I want to be on a computer? Well, this is why, because experimental development is once again costly, time consuming and difficult. But in this case, it also has other features to it. Um, the phrase that's used here, if you really, a common way of doing this is basically you take the antigen you want to get something against. So this is the target that you want to target against. And you inject it into, it's usually a mouse, sometimes it's a rabbit. And then they use this phrase, which I find difficult, which is harvest the immune system. I think you can guess what that means happens to the mouse. OK, so not doing that would be a good thing, I think, if we could find a way of not be doing that. You can do this in other ways as well. So you can raise them in kind of cell cultures. You, you can raise them in yeast. But there's a lot of use of animals to raise these. And then what you're trying to do is create an antibody. Now, there's one final problem here, if you'd use any of these systems to do this, is that they're not human. If I give you, and, and I'm hoping if you've listened to enough of the talk, this is a fairly obvious answer. If I inject you with a mouse antibody right now, can you guess what would happen? What would happen is your own antibodies would go, that's not self, let's kill it. Which makes it not a very good drug, basically. Because <laughs> your own body goes, destroy. Yep. Now, it might be a one-hit wonder, because if it can do what it needs to do quickly enough and your body can't, react to it fast enough, then OK. But it will never work again on you. And it needs to have done everything it needs to do in that time frame. But it can also cause other problems, because I'm now interfering with your immune system. So if I give you something that's non-human, all sorts of things might happen inside your immune system. And if any of you have watched, it always seems to be, have any of you seen House? Do you know what I'm talking about? No, OK. In that program, everything seems to be some form of autoimmune disease, and they all have really great names. But actually, autoimmune diseases are really not very nice, and they're very hard to solve because it's effectively your own body attacking itself, and that is, once again, very dangerous. So what you want to be able to do is design antibodies. And we've built lots and lots of tools to do this. And I am not going to take up the next several hours of your life to describe them all. Instead, I'm just going to show you one in operation. <coughs> and I did cheat because I knew a website wouldn't work. So hopefully this will. So this is just our website. And we're going to go and look at this database. I'm going to search for a structure. And that, in fact, is the drug that I was talking about earlier. And this is the summary of what it looks like. And then I'm going to go and predict its structure and try and find out if we think it would be a safe antibody to use. So that's its sequence entered in there. And I'm trying to build a three-dimensional model of it now. That's what's happening. And it is happening, I promise. Eventually, some text will start appearing in this box here. So the software currently is trying to build a three-dimensional model of this antibody. There we go. Starting to build it. I suspect you can't read that. It's not very exciting. It's telling you what lines of code are doing, just to make sure it's actually working properly. And that's me getting bored playing with the mouse while we wait. OK, now it's finished. So each one of these graphs is showing you whether I think this is a good antibody or not. And the green lines are where this antibody falls. And because it falls in the main part of that blue distribution, that's good. This is the structural model of it. And here I've just shown the hydrophobicity on that antibody <coughs> signed up at the end. So I'm hoping that vaguely convinces you that there's a series of things capable of doing all of that. So I'm going to finish now, mostly not to take up too much of your time. And I have two things I always have to remember to say thank you for. Across the bottom here, this is a set of organizations that very kindly give me lots of money so I'm able to do the things I really like doing. And then on the top here, this is my group who actually do all the work I have just described as opposed to me actually doing it. And I think that you have to admire the beautiful photoshopping of the set of people kneeling at the front who didn't make it to our retreat. And you might discover the two-headed person at the back as well. But thank you very much. <laughs>